Hi everybody, the purpose of this um, lecture is to basically take us through the meat of World War II from um, roughly Operation Barbarossa and its beginnings um, to um, when the Allies are prepared to relaunch Operation Overlord. This is the heart of the war. Um, as you can see on your left, um, this is the absolute height of Nazi power. That map right there is when the Nazis will be at their complete and um, most dominant as far as the most land they control. Um, and this is also the turning the tide of the war and the real um, time when like, you know, the major, major events really occur on this. Um, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Um, um, when we left off our last slide, um, if you remember Hitler, or last lecture, Hitler had tried to invade Britain, um, and he'd failed fairly spectacularly. Um, it wasn't necessarily that he lost badly one way or the other, but it was the first time that the Nazis were stopped. And it was the first time the Nazis were able to, or the, sorry, the Allies were able to um, have some type of like, you know, um, way of just being like, no, you're not just going to run over everything, because they had been blitzkrieg and run over everything prior to that. Um, now, with that in mind, um, Hitler turns away from Britain when Operation Sea Lion is not going to be able to work, um, and he turns towards what he'd really wanted from the beginning, which is Russia. Before he can get to the Soviet Union, though, he's got to clean up the mess in the Balkans right here. Um, and two things have happened. Um, one, to make a really long story short, um, Yugoslavia had agreed to join the Tripartite Pact. Um, then its government had fallen, and then its king had been run out, and so then it had backtracked. Um, and that made that looked really bad. You know, you can't say, "Hey, I'm going to join the Nazis and then not join the Nazis and not have the Nazis invade you," right? Um, and also, um, um, Mussolini had said, you know, hey, Hitler, I really kind of want to do something. And you can almost see this kind of like a petulant child if you want to. And um, as a result, Hitler had said, hey, you know, invade, invade Greece. Eventually, we're going to want to take over that area. But then the Greeks actually started winning. Um, and so before he can get to Operation Barbarossa, Hitler needs to launch two um, uh, attacks called Operation 25 and Operation Maria. Operation 25 is the invasion of Yugoslavia. Operation Merida is the invasion of Greece. They both occur on the exact same day. Yugoslavia falls within like 11 days. I think it is Greece holds out for something like 24 or something along those lines. Um, but Operation 25 is going to become really important to world history in the end because that guy on the right right there is a man by the name of Joseph Braz, also known as Marshal Tito, okay? And he's going to lead the partisan movement, and the partisan is going to be the anti-Nazi movement in Yugoslavia. Um, and uh, Yugoslavia is going to be massively divided with a lot, number of Croatians um, joining the Nazis in something called the Ustasa. Um, but Braz's partisan movement, Tito's partisan movement, is going to be a thorn in the side of the Nazis. They're going to have to leave people in Yugoslavia trying to stop the partisans, trying to stop their continued guerrilla attacks. They could be fighting the war on the Western Front or the Eastern Front or something along those lines. Um, and, uh, and he's able to continue to do this, and it's partisan with a capital P, and actually how we get partisan with a little p is a derivative from this. By the end of the war, though, Tito is going to be really popular. He's going to become the communist dictator, but not necessarily Cold War communist, different style type of communist dictator, benevolent communist dictator, very much beloved of Yugoslavia um, at the end of the war. So he's going to be somebody that comes up for kind of the rest of this course or so um, throughout European politics and history. He's going to live all the way until 1980 or so. Um, the decision to open up the Balkans in the end, though, really hurts the axis because it's given them yet another front that they now have to defend, which is what Hitler had really learned from World War One and what he was trying not to have happen now is precisely what's going to happen now that you you know, stopped on the Western Front, opened up the Balkan Front, and are about to open another front up on the East with Operation Barbarossa. Which brings us to Operation Barbarossa. This, um, named after um, the legendary uh, Holy Roman Empire King Frederick Barbarossa, or Redbeard, is going to be um, Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. And make no mistake about it, this is Hitler's great mistake right here. Okay, this is it. Um, the generals told him not to do it. Um, everybody told Stalin it was coming. Stalin didn't listen. Everybody told Hitler not to do it. Hitler didn't listen. Um, I mean, it's just a disaster all around. The goal is this. The goal is to do a couple things. One, seize the Ukrainian oil fields, okay, and or sorry, the Ukrainian wheat fields and farms and stuff like that. Remember, we talked about that being the breadbasket of Europe. Two, push towards the oil fields of Central Asia. The Nazis are starting to run out of things. They need to literally fight the war. You can't run tanks if you don't have oil to make them run. And by the time you get to the southern part of the Soviet Union, down where Stalingrad is there, right, you can push towards Central Asia. And then three um, will be the um, final implementation of General Plan Ost on the uh, population at this time. Um, the Nazis are going to launch this attack from Poland, and they're going to um, split into three groups, creatively named Army Group North, Army Group Center, and Army Group South. Um, of the guys that you know, um, Gerd Rundstedt is going to lead um, Army Group South down towards Stalingrad. Um, Manstein is going to be part of the force that takes Leningrad, though eventually he's going to actually make his way all the way through down to Moscow and then eventually on to Stalingrad as well. 
Um, behind these guys come the Einsatzgruppen at all times, and this is going to be like the brutal undesirableness that is the of the undesirables, uh, like the brutal killing of quote unquote undesirables that is the Eastern Holocaust. And as we talked about. Um, in the past in class, you know, in the in the central part in the West, kind of from Poland and West over and stuff like that, um, Jews were, were rounded up and put into camps and systematically exterminated that way. In the East, they were basically taken out in the woods and shot. Um, there are uncountable discovery or uncountable um, atrocities committed by the Einsatzgruppen as well as the Wehrmacht during this time that are still being discovered. I mean, literally just whole ravines like the massacre, massacre at Baba Yar in um, uh, uh, outside of Ukraine or sorry in Ukraine, um, where like thirty three thousand plus um, people were just killed in a ditch um, and stuff like that. I mean, and just just all sorts of unspeakable atrocities. I mean, things like you know, um, you know, we're we're going to need to test out gas, so we're going to pick up like random Jewish kids off the road in Minsk. And throw them in the back of a gas van and see how long it takes to kill them and gas wise stuff like that. I mean, this is the real beginning of kind of the horrors of the East or so. Um, Army Group North um, begins by liberating, and I say that in quotes because this is a big um, issue here, by liberating the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. These states had been taken over um, by. Uh, by um, Stalin, and they've been annexed um, right after the uh, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, if you remember that. Um, and now the Nazis are coming in, and they're being treated by the conqueror, by the uh, by the people in these states in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania as like conquering heroes. Um, and it's only once they get in there that they're going to find out their true nature. Um, most famously, um, in Vilnius, which was considered the Jerusalem, the, the north, a population of between two hundred fifty and five hundred thousand Jews is taken down to about four thousand or so. So um, these this area, this bloodlands, is really going to get crapped on hardcore at this point, and like in the biggest thing, because this is where it's going to see first. Hitler, then Stalin, then Hitler, then, I mean, back and forth and back and forth and just unspeakable amounts of, like, death and destruction to these people and stuff along those lines. Um, the areas in the Baltics and stuff like that, for example, are not going to be fully liberated. They don't consider this thing ending until 1991 or so when they're liberated from the Soviet Union and the Cold War and stuff along those lines at the end of the Cold War. Um, I, mentioned, um, I mentioned on the... Uh, the um, previous slide that uh, this would be the implementation of General Plan Ost, and I want to just show you these numbers at some point, or, or now, um, as I said, I'd show you at some point. Um, this is the um, uh, summation or the the definition of something that um, Reinhard Heydrich had cheered, had chaired. Um, in uh, the winter of uh, 42, like, and by winter, I mean like January of 42, like that time, okay, called the Von C Conference. And at the Von C Conference um, is where the Nazis discuss what they want to do about the final solution to the so-called Jewish question. By the way, the Jewish question is a line that had been used in European history and politics for nearly a thousand years. That gives you an idea of why I said that, yeah, like, the Nazis did this, and it's horrible, but this is also the culmination of a thousand years of anti-Semitism. You know, what do we do about the Jewish question, quote, unquote. And that's what the Von C Conference is here about. And um, after a number of different things. It's chaired by Reinhard Heydrich. It's um, led by Adolf Eichmann. These are ma massive war criminals you probably have heard of before. Um, Eichmann will, for example, be um, hanged in Israel after escaping on a rat line in the 60s um, after the war. Um, it's chaired by them or, and run by them. And um, here they decide that the answer to the Jewish question will be the final solution, which will be the elimination and um, uh, systematic murder of a number of people in Eastern Europe. And yes, as I said, they had it down um, to a uh, to literally a complete science right here. You can see on the left, like 80 to 85 percent of Poles, 50 to 60 percent of Russians would be eliminated with some sense of Siberia, uh, 50 percent of Latvians, 85 percent of Lithuanians, 50 percent of Estonians, um, stuff along those lines. Um, and so I wanted to give you an idea of, of kind of the, the horrors of the Eastern Holocaust. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we don't have time to go into it as much, but it was really unknown about, unwritten about until after the Cold War, because the Russians, when they were reconquering stuff, just covered it up. They didn't really document it like the Western Allies did. Um, and only now are we really realizing the systematic atrocity of this. Um, the thing you see on the right, by the way, is the entrance to um, the um, museum about this in um, Estonia, in Tallinn. And I just always thought it was fascinating because, you know, you've got like kind of stuck between Hitler and Stalin right there with the Russians on the left or the Soviets on the left and the Nazis on the right. And that's exactly the area that these um, are the place these, these areas were in. Okay. After ripping through the Baltics, Army Group North is going to make its way into Leningrad. Okay, remember, this is the window on the west. This is the old um, Russian city, now Soviet city, that used to be the capital for 300 years. The, the, the um, communists had turned and moved the capital back to Moscow, but for years and years and years, St. Petersburg um, 
which they have renamed Leningrad, was the main like first city within the Soviet or within Russia. Okay, and so that's where this is: Leningrad, Saint Petersburg, same thing. Okay, they lay the city under siege. A siege that starts in September of 1941 and it lasts all the way until January of 1944, a 900 long day siege set by German and Finnish forces. Okay, this is one of the most brutal natural disasters that occurred in a, well, not natural, man made, obviously, but like wartime disasters um, that occurred as a result of the war, not through systematic like rounding up of people, that's what I mean by natural, but through like literal war was occurring and then these people became innocent bystanders who starved to death like crazy. Um, Manstein is in charge of this for a while, but then he's eventually moved on to Stalingrad. They circle the city. That's what it means to lay siege. Um, they cut off all communications, all food supply, all, all heat, water, etc., etc. And that's why I said it's a humanitarian disaster. The deaths on this, the death toll ranges somewhere between one and a half million to uh, some people as upwards as five million, though that number is not really accepted. Usually two and a half is considered to be like the highest thing here or so. Um, and they basically try, and that's what you do during a siege, to starve the city out. Um, the city doesn't do it. It finds ways around it. It gets out on the ice. Um, there are tales of eating zoo animals, then pets, then cannibalism, stuff like that. The Red Army is able to get through. And and St. Petersburg, Leningrad, um, as it is now called, um, is able to hold on, albeit to the detriment of, um, of um, millions of people during this time. Um, and so Army Group North kind of comes to a crashing halt there. Okay? Army Group Center... Um, blows by Kiev and through there is an utterly obliterating the Soviets at this point. Um, Army Group Center is so dominant um, that at this point um, Stalin um, actually loses his numerical advantage. The one thing the Red Army always has is a numerical advantage. And Stalin loses his numerical advantage because he's lost so many men and he has to conscript a bunch more people before that can happen. Um, the Red Army Group Center gets literally to the gates of Moscow. And two, um, and they're about to take Moscow. It's imminent. The Nazis think it's going to happen. The Soviets think it's going to happen. Stalin had a contingency plan to go hide behind the Ural Mountains for this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and two things happen. One, they get there in late November, and the Russian winter sets in. And if Hitler had been a student of Napoleon or anybody else, he would have known that you do not invade Russia in the winter because that is always a problem. It gets really cold, and the Nazis are kind of locked up there. Two, in the course of rallying the troops, a man by the name of Georgi Zukov, who I brought up in your Who's Who in World War II people, emerges. This is going to be the great general of the Red Army, the most decorated Russian or Soviet general in history. And Georgi Zukov, who we will keep bringing up, is able to rally the troops um, and hold Army Group Center at Moscow. Okay? Now, at this point, as things start to warm up in the spring of 42 or so, um, they are both stuck, stuck there right outside Moscow. And after losing this and realizing that they haven't taken Leningrad as quickly as they wanted to, they had to deal with the winter, they didn't take Moscow as quickly as they wanted to, the Nazis have to regroup their plans. And so they take army group center away from North Moscow. They turn it south down to Stalingrad so that they can push towards like the like oil plains of Central Asia that they desperately need. And so at this point, like both armies turn south away from Moscow and down towards the Battle of Stalingrad, which we'll get into in one second. Okay, before I get into the Battle of Stalingrad here, though, we need to take a short interruption to deal with two really, really big events that occurred in the war. The first one in December of 41, and the next one in May of 42. The first one in December of 41 you've probably heard of is the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Okay, and this is when the Japanese... Um, uh, Air Force um, decides to attack the U.S. naval base, the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Okay, um, and if you're wondering the reasons behind this, and we'll go into this a ton more in U.S. history next year, it really was based in and around oil. The Japanese knew that if they attacked another place, like say Indonesia or modern-day Malaysia, the United States would probably declare war. And so their thought was is they'd have this dastardly plan where they'd wreck the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Okay, have the U.S. declare war, but then be able to take over enough things for the next year and a half while the U.S. rebuilt its fleet. Um, and uh, um, and then um, be able to like you know fight the U.S. in an actual war here with the resources and stuff they need. Okay, not not actually the the worst thought out plan in the world. Um, once you actually know what's going on, um, the problem is twofold. Um, one. Um, the United States gets really, really lucky when this attack occurs. Um, some of the um, aircraft carriers, which are like the like most important things in the Navy, are out, so the Japanese are not able to hit them, etc., etc. Um, some people are able to kind of rally the troops um, in ways that, like, um, you know, they weren't to not sink as many U.S. ships, stuff along those lines. Two, though, okay, and this is the thing they completely overlooked. They didn't overlook that this would get the U.S. in the war. It absolutely got the U.S. in the war. What both the Japanese and the Nazis 
overlooked massively was the United States production power, okay? Um, the German generals were given production numbers. How much could the U.S. produce if they got into the war in the course of, like, a year? Um, and the numbers were so high, they literally laughed out the building. Those can't be right. The economists are wrong, blah, 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 blah. It turns out those numbers were low. Those numbers were probably half of what the U.S. could actually produce. When Churchill saw the numbers, again, the numbers that were too low, he actually got so giddy that he was willing to give up his um, uh, general, Montgomery, who's in command, and basically say, okay, like Eisenhower can be the supreme commander of the Allied forces, stuff like that. So the production and manpower of the United States completely changes the war here, and from December 7th, 1941, um, we are now involved. Nazi Germany will declare war on the United States after the United States declares war on Japan. The second thing that happens, um, Reinhard Heydrich, the um, head of the SD, one of Hitler's, like, you know, um, access of evil up there with like you know Goebbels and Himmler and stuff like that is um, driving down um, uh, the road in his open air marsh cities that he takes every single day in May of 42 um, when he is assassinated. Um, his legs are blown off and um, he slowly dies of uh, blood poisoning over the course of the next week or so. Um, this is absolutely massive. It changes the Nazi power structure and hierarchy significantly. Um, Hitler's revenge is brutal. They go to the town of Lidice, where the assassins were from, and they literally eradicate the entire town, um, killing all men, women, and children, and taking all kids that are under the age of five and look Aryan and giving them to Germans and taking all the other ones and throwing them in camps and stuff like that. Um, and so these really kind of change the course of like, you know, who's involved in the war and also what the Nazis are working with um, before we actually get to like the Battle of Stalingrad here. Okay, the Battle of Stalingrad is going to occur in the winter of 42 and spring of 43 here, okay? And it is, from the European perspective, the single most important battle in World War II, okay? Um, this is the turning of the tide. World War II could not be run without the Soviets. Um, and this is the single most important battle from a European perspective in World War II. On a side note, it's also the single bloodiest battle in human history. Casualty numbers are up around 2.5 to 3 million in this thing. Um, it is absolutely brutal. Um, the Nazis arrive at Stalingrad, having kind of made their way through the Soviet Union by the fall of that year, by the fall of 42, okay? And Stalingrad is a city on the banks of the Volga River that matters for two reasons, okay? One really matters, and two is psychological. Let's talk about one first. One really matters because once they pass Stalingrad, and once they get through the Volga River and stuff like that, um, they will be have access to the oil fields of Central Asia, which means that any Nazi tanks that didn't have enough oil to run will now have suddenly enough oil to run. Also, if you think about the world, that also means that Japan, theoretically, having taken over China, could come and create like kind of a pincher movement, and the two armies could meet in a land thing with the Nazi army on one side and the Japanese army on the other side. Big problem for the Allies, okay? Big problem for the Allies. Two, literally the battle's name. It is the Battle of Stalingrad, okay? Much like after Leningrad was named after Lenin, Stalin thought, hey, you know, I need to name a city after me and stuff like that. So he picked this one, he named it after himself, and it would be a massive psychological blow to lose the Battle of Stalingrad for the Soviet Union. And as a result, both armies decide that, like, this is where they are going to make a stand, okay? Battle starts in August, and it rages through September of 40, or sorry, through February of 43. Um, both armies, for example, issue no surrender orders um, and fire on their own troops that try to come back. Um, the Russians are in such dire strait that it's at this battle that they very famously, um, you know, can script a bunch of people because that's their whole, whole move is the Russian strategy is we're just going to throw tons and tons of people at these Nazis until they like have to back down and it's during this time that literally they hand out rifles to every other person and they say okay the one with the rifle shoots until he dies and what they do for the person behind him is they give him a bunch of bullets and then once the one with the rifle dies the one with the bullets picks up his rifle and shoots until he dies so basically I mean saying hey you're gonna sacrifice yourself for the motherland and here's how you're gonna do it um this also is, I mean, this gets to be brutal because neither side is willing to give in. You get stories of like, you know, various buildings literally like being like <laughs> taken over and then them having like fighting like hand to hand combat because they've run out of like um, weapon or sorry, run out of bullets and stuff like that um, over various floors. And if you go online, you can find maps of like, you know, there were like 30 Nazis on the top three floors and like 45 like Soviets on the bottom three floors. And they met on the fourth floor and like got into this huge like, you know, Mortal Kombat style brawl, right? Um, I mean, and this is just like war is all hell the opinion of it there's a great um movie we would have watched the beginning of at least called enemy at the gates if you have some time and want to check out um some idea of like of, of what this might have kind of looked like from a hollywood point of view um and unsurprisingly um as it always seems to happen the nazis are in position to win this thing at first
okay? Um, in November of, um, of uh, 1942, though, all that changes, okay? And by the way, what you're looking at is something called the Motherland Calls. This is a huge statue outside what is now Volgograd. They now like to call it Stalingrad to commemorate this victory here. I mean, uh, you should look it up online, but it's something like, you know, like like five, six, seven times the size of like the Statue of Liberty, something along those lines um, as you look at it, maybe even more so than that. Um, so what happens to change the tide is something that um, is uh, Georgi Zukov goes out, he takes a look at the battle, and actually this is his brainchild and this is his genius. And it's something called Operation Uranus, okay? Now this is a deep penetrating two-pronged maneuver that begins from the Soviet rear, okay? Um, and yes, I'm stopping there for a second for those of you that picked up on my joke here. This is much like, you know, us talking about like the use of like the law of spikelets and the hoe and stuff like that, but it was Operation Uranus and it was, not jokingly, begun from the back lines, a deep penetrating maneuver meant to target the Romanian and Hungarian forces that are protecting the Nazi flanks. Um, what there is, for those of you that don't fully understand that, what you're looking at is they want to hit the sides of the line like crazy so that they can encircle the Nazis and make them collapse. And it works. It works like crazy. And the sixth Nazi army gets completely encircled. Hitler issues a no surrender order and says, nope, you can't surrender no matter what. As a matter of fact, he's got a General Frederick Paulus in there who actually promotes to field marshal just so he won't surrender because no field marshal, no Prussian field marshal ever surrendered his army in the field. Um, but it becomes so hopeless um, that actually Manstein actually in the field overrules um, Hitler. Um, subtly without him knowing that and allows people to go ahead and surrender. Manstein's kind of taking control down at this point. And so um, in the end, the Nazis, or sorry, the Nazis end up surrendering like 22 generals or so, um, along with tons of weapons and stuff like this. Um, the three pockets finally collapse and they all surrender. It is a massive blow to the German psyche. And after this point, most generals, and by most generals, I mean people like Rommel, Grunstead, Manstein, Paula, stuff like that, as well as most reasonable, and I guess there's no such thing as a reasonable Nazi, but when I say reasonable, I mean not completely and totally like blindsided by like the idiocy of this war. So I'm talking about people like Albert Speer or stuff like that, okay? Most of those guys will privately admit that this war cannot be won. And anybody who's followed the war knows that this war cannot be won, okay? The Nazis, sadly, knowing that, begin like this really absurd policy of like total war where they mean, they've been doing total war where they launched everything, but Goebbels gives a famous speech of January of 43 where he talks about it. And they say that, uh, you know, everybody as young as 16, as old as 60, everybody's got to fight to defend um, the uh, German homeland, et cetera, et cetera. And it ends up really in the in the sad deaths of, uh, of um, tons and tons of people by the time we get to the Battle of Berlin that did not need to die. Um, meanwhile, Zhukov and the Red Army begin their kind of slow and steady marches. So now Hitler has had his front collapse on one side and is kind of slowly coming in to the next one. Okay, meanwhile, the United States has entered the war. <clears throat> and um, the United States had really wanted to attack France first. Um, France was a natural ally. Um, they thought that France would um, allow the Nazis to be a psychological blow on a number of reasons and stuff like that. And actually, um, Churchill is the one that talks us out of this. Okay, Churchill actually compares the Axis to a turtle, if this makes sense. And he says, I'm not joking, that um, France is like the shell in Fortress Europe and stuff like that, but the soft underbelly, the part you could flip over and eat pretty easily, is Italy. So why don't we attack from the bottom first, okay? And you'll see this on a map in a second in case you're not getting your idea here. But to do this, what the Allies need to do is they need to take control of what is now French, so that's Axis North Africa, okay? Because the French has been conquered by that. Um, and um, that is led by a tank aficionado, Erwin Rommel, who's sitting there on kind of the center. Um, and he's being chased around the desert by uh, British General Bernard Montgomery, the guy on the far right over there here. Um, and uh, Rommel, remember, is one of these people who uh, had, had basically staked his life on tanks and stuff like that. And um, at something called the Second Battle of El Alamein, okay, and let me give you an idea of how important it is. This is a Churchill quote, okay, Churchill said, before El Alamein, we never had a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat. So that gives you an idea of how big of a game changer this is. This is, you know, turning the tide on the Western Front here. Okay, this in D-Day, what we've turned the tide on the Eastern Front with Stalingrad. We're now going to turn the tide on the Western Front here. Okay. Um, and El Alamein, um, Mont Montgomery is finally able, with the help of a little U.S. air support, to trap Erwin Rommel, <clears throat> who breaks out and runs away. Okay. Rommel gets away despite the fact that Hitler had told him to stand and fight and die. Um, Rommel's so popular, Hitler's not willing to actually do anything about that. Um, and Rommel will eventually come back up and help um, the Nazis try to plan their defensive of D-Day and stuff along those lines. Um, but once he breaks out and runs, this is the first major victory the Allies have had on the Western Front, period. 
not like in a certain, I mean, period. And we are in like 42 at this point of the war, right? Um, what this does is it allows, the, leads the, uh, it allows the Americans, led by Dwight D. Eisenhower, who's our top general and will soon become Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, um, to land at three key places in North Africa, uh, complete operation tor completing Operation Torch. And what that does is it's going to secure North Africa. And then what they're going to do, if you can envision this in your head, is jump across and invade Sicily. And from Sicily, they're going to invade Italy, which is what we're going to talk about in the next uh, couple slides or so. Um, I wanted you guys to um, take a quick look at this um, just because it's fascinating and funny. Um, um, in case you're not aware of this, uh, Theodore Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss, um, was a huge um, war propagandist for the United States during the war. And he did a ton of anti-Nazi um, things here. And I love um, not only looking at this, you can Google and look for more if you want. Um, also just to see all these commentaries and all these things drawn um, in Dr. Seuss style with like, you know, Nazism. So like on the left, you have like, you know, <clears throat> the Nazis and then they're taking over everything, France, Czechoslovakia, et cetera, et cetera. On the right, you have the Nazis kind of, or sorry, in the middle, you have the Nazis kind of stuck, um, you know, in Russia while the United States sneaks up behind and stuff like that. And then the one that made me think of this one, which is probably my all-time favorite right here, has these two little birds right here. And it says up on the left, gee, General Rommel sure can run. And the other one says, yep, sure can, can he? Um, and so I just thought this was a nice little like interlude to take a look at and understand like, you know, what's going on on the home front and how this works and like, you know, kind of the intersection of pop culture and, uh, and the war and stuff like that here. Okay, last two things before we're ready to end this middle part of the war and have completely turned the tide. Um, <clears throat> before the Allies can invade... Um, uh, Italy. Um, the Red Army has to begin its kind of slow march west, and they use the classic Russian strategy of we have more people than you do um, in order to do this. Okay, um, The only real opposition they're going to run into is something called the Battle of Kursk, which is the largest tank battle of history, and it actually represents one of the times that the Nazis probably could have won, most historians and military historians believe, but Hitler yet again overruled his troops and told them to wait. And so the Russian army was able to get together and crush the last um, a Nazi attempt in the east. And from here, Zhukov, and that's him in the middle, um, begins that, that kind of march. He, um, in Operation Bagration, um, he takes over or retakes over Ukraine um, and uh, uh, Belarus. In uh, the Baltic Offensive, he reconquers Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania um, at the head of their threat army. In something called Operation Vistula Odor, he begins like the liberation of Poland. Um, Auschwitz, for example, is liberated in January of 45 um, by Zhukov and the Red Army. Um, and all this leads to something that becomes known as the race to Berlin, where both the Eastern Allies and the Western Allies are both trying to get to Berlin to see who can conquer it first. Um, spoiler alert, but the Red Army is going to win, and the fact that the Red Army takes over um, and liberates large parts of, of Eastern Europe, they're going to leave that army there for an extended period of time, and this is what's going to directly lead to the Cold War, to communism rising in those countries and stuff along those lines. So um, the fact that this happens in the way that it does, it's not, it's not super controversial, and it's like military sound, but it forever changes history kind of after World War II. Um, so the race to Berlin has actually begun. Um, now, in that race, um, the last thing we're going to talk about here, um, the um, Allies has successfully opened up that Mediterranean front again, the one that, like, you know, by including, like, the Balkans and stuff like that, Hitler had that many more people involved here. And um, what they've done is they've landed, if you look at the bottom left, in Tunisia and North Africa, okay, and then they're going to invade um, on... Again, we're on the left, the little um, boot part, the island part of Italy. They're going to invade Sicily there, and then they're going to jump over the mainland, and then they're going to kind of run up Italy like that. Um, and all this is going to be led by the dude in the middle, a very acerbic and controversial, yet very popular general by the name of George Patton. Um, Patton eventually had to be relieved of his command because um, there was a soldier who had PTSD, and he went into the hospital and called him a big wimp and slapped him a few times, and that actually even was controversial in 1944 or 43 or whenever it happened or so. Um, and, uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to slowly, almost you can think of it like a layer cake, like take it, retake Italy, which is very narrow, kind of layer by layer. Um, Italy's mountains um, and the fact that Patton is obsessed with tanks make this a little bit slower. Um, but eventually they are absolutely crushing um, the Italians. And what happens is Mussolini runs and um, he basically runs to Hitler. And um, Hitler um, understands that he can't have his um, you know, closest ally fall and stuff like that. So he sends Germans into um, Italy to neutralize this like allied like overrun of Italy that's currently going on right now. And they do. Um, it takes out, they're able to push them back down and actually the Allies have to fight the Germans all the way until April um, slash early May of 45 before Italy's actually going to fall or so here. But the other thing this does is it opens up yet more people and another front that like Hitler has to defend. I mean, and if you think about this, like you've got people on the east he's defending. 
He's also got all sorts of people in these camps defending and trying to commit mass murder that he could be using to like fight the war. Now he's got all these people, and by that I mean all the guards in the camps, okay? He's got all these people now in Italy that he could be using to try to slow the Russian offensive or stop things and stuff like that. And so it's just opening up another front, and the Nazis are slowly being caught and like surrounded by all sides. Um, after, uh, after leaving the first time, um, and then coming back, Benito Mussolini comes back with the German army. Um, the second time after the German army has been overrun and it's clear they're going to lose, um, Mussolini is finally caught by a bunch of Italian communists. Um, they're told by Patton to wait so he can have a trial. Um, and uh, supposedly it's an accident, it's a translation issue, etc., etc. You can believe what you want. It's suspect all around. Um, but um, they decide that, you know, they're going to give Mussolini a, a quote-unquote trial right there along with his mistress. And they actually shoot Benito Mussolini after the trial execution. And then they hang him upside down um, from a gas station along with a bunch of compatriots. This is what you're looking at right there. And Italians walk by and throw um, dead, rotten tomatoes at his body and stuff like that for a few days before they take it down. And that is the end of Benito Mussolini. And so at this point, like, the Allies are coming all around um, Hitler. Everything but France has fronts on it to be opened up and liberated. Um, the war has definitely changed the tide, and we will wrap it up um, next week when we talk about, like, D-Day to the end.